here. Here we go. No. Am I sharing the correct slides? Yes, you are. I am? OK. I was, having, I was looking strange on my computer for a minute there. So. And I believe we're live. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. We'll just let. Um, Give everybody a few more minutes to, to filter in before we get started, but welcome everybody. Okay, well, it's 7.05. Um, so maybe I'll start going through my introduction and there'll still be lots of time um, for other participants to join before um, Dr. Bear gets into her presentation. So uh, welcome everybody. We're, we're quite excited to do this and to, to have you here today. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging that the lands that the CF Canada National Office are located on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, 
the Ashinabak, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee Ga, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. And I know we have people joining us from across Canada uh, on lands that are the traditional uh, territories of many different nations. Uh, so again, welcome to everybody. We're, we're quite excited to be um, holding this uh, webinar tonight. Um, so my name is Paul Eckford. I'm the Program Director for Research at Cystic Fibrosis Canada. Um, and we'll be joined um, by Christine Baer uh, in a few minutes to give her lecture, but I'm gonna bore you with a few other things first. So I hope you'll, you'll indulge me. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how CF Canada funds research and researchers such as Dr. Baer and how we are including individuals from the CF community in that process as well. I'll introduce to you the Kathleen Morrison Research Impact Award and some of the funding that has enabled us to support Dr. Bear in her work. Um, and then we'll hear from Dr. Bear, and we'll do a short uh, Q&A session at the end. So hopefully you're seeing here something called Slido with a number and a QR code. We're gonna try this out um, to get some feedback from the audience as we go along. So if you've got your smartphone there, you can, should be able to just hold it up to the screen and scan the code and go right to the Slido page. Otherwise, if you go to slido.com and enter this code in, uh, you'll get to the same, same location. So I'm gonna skip to the next slide, but this code will be on that slide and the QR code and the number will be there as well. Um, and, and so this is the, the same one here. So if you can join, um, that Slido website. As we go through the webinar, if there are poll questions, they should just appear on, on your screen if you leave that open. But if you accidentally close it, don't worry because every uh, screen will have the code there on the side like you see now. So the first question, and you've already started to, to answer, this is just to get you going, um, is how is everybody feeling today? Um, and it looks like we're getting some good responses here. So everybody's able to, to try it out. And as more people say good or great, it, it should resize to, um, to reflect how many people gave those answers. So I'll just give a couple more minutes so everybody can get to, to the site and, and try it out. And you'll be able to type into the Zoom chat box later if you have a question for Dr. Bear, or you'll be able to use the Slido site as well. So it says one, one more participant is up. Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to uh, skip along to the next question now. Oh, sorry. No more questions right now. That'll be a little later. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about our uh, grants and awards that the organization has. So every year we fund a competition for researchers at um, hospitals, uh, universities across Canada, um, where they can submit their proposals on the research that they want to do. And then it's subjected to a very rigorous review process. And we fund some of those researchers to do that work that they've proposed. Um, and Cystic Fibrosis Canada has been around since 1960. And we've funded many very important discoveries in the field over that time. So the discovery of the CF gene itself, um, studies on what the function of the CFTR protein is, and, and Dr. Baer was um, instrumental in, in that one there. Also other things like the high fat diets that really helped um, improve the lives of CF patients early on and many other discoveries. And we've invested over $200 million into research since 1960. And, um, you, you can see the great impact that we've had there, but obviously we're not done. There's a lot more to know, a lot more to learn, and a lot more ways that uh, researchers will be able to improve the lives of people with CF. 
So you'll see on the side here, this is just a little bit of a schematic of how uh, the process works. And so researchers submit their proposals to us with scientific language, but also sections that are a little more easy to understand. They, they provide a budget of what sorts of funds they need to do their work and talk about their past experience and why they have the expertise to do the work that they've proposed. So we get these applications and we send them out to international experts all around the world. Um, and they read them and they provide feedback to us on those applications. We also develop a panel of uh, scientific experts primarily in Canada and the US. And we send these applications out to these reviewers as well, who provide even more extensive comments and scoring on the applications. But we don't just reach out to scientists, we also reach out to a panel of individuals we call our community reviewers. This is made up of mostly people with CF or family members or close, um, close friends of individuals with cystic fibrosis, because we need to get some perspective, not only on is the proposal scientifically sound, but also is it something that's going to have real impact for um, CF patients. And so we need to reach out to the people who know that. Finally, all of these individuals meet on a Zoom meeting much like this, where they discuss the merits of all the applications, both from a scientific perspective and from a community impact perspective. And it's both of these types of reviews that contribute to determining which are the top applications that get awarded by CF Canada. And there are always more good fundable applications than we have the resources to fund. So we have to pick the ones that we feel are the best science, absolute top, and the ones that are gonna have strong impact potentially for the CF community. So an important part of this process, as I've mentioned, is our community reviewers. Um, and it's a tough job. There's a lot of work to be done. So it involves over 20 hours of reading these scientific applications and evaluating them. Then three days of review panel meetings where the, the proposals are discussed and people sort of have to defend their views on why one proposal is, is better than another. And it's a large time commitment, but it, it's really important. And our community reviewers consistently tell us that it is, while it's, it's very tough, it's very rewarding to be involved. Um, and, and it's really important to get the perspectives of the community to fund the applications that we fund. And one other thing that they get to do is uh, through the scores they give to the applications on research impact, they decide who the winner of the Kathleen Morrison Research Impact Award is. Right now we're accepting applications for community reviewers for our next review panel. Um, and as I mentioned, we look for people with cystic fibrosis and those close to them so that they have the knowledge about how the proposals could impact the daily lives of people with CF. The application deadline is September 30th of this year and you apply through our Elevate program and you don't have to be a scientist but you have to know something about what it's like to live with CF. And we provide training on the whole process for anybody who is selected. So I'm going to turn it over to Magdalena now, who's gonna tell you a little bit about uh, Elevate, which is the tool you would use to apply to, to this opportunity. Hello everyone, and thank you, Paul. My name is Magdalena and I work in the Marketing and Communications Department at Cystic Fibrosis Canada, and I am also a member of the Elevate and Amplifier teams. Uh, we started Elevate to ensure that our work is being guided by our Canadian CF community. So through this program, members receive emailed opportunities for input, which is anything from a two minute survey, a focus group, um, or more, uh, they can choose to participate as often as they'd like. So it's very flexible. Since the start of the program last year, uh, members have participated in nearly 20 opportunities, which includes reviewing research grant proposals and helping to determine the research we fund, which is the community reviewers opportunity, designing CF Canada apparel, participating in focus groups uh, for information and support program, and so much more. 
Uh, members also receive third-party opportunities, which is vetted by Cystic Fibrosis Canada. So when we have an opportunity, we'll send it out to the group and you can let us know if it interests you and if you have time. Uh, we're always looking for new members. So if you'd like to know more or sign up, please visit cysticfibrosis.ca forward slash elevate or fibroscystique forward slash amplifier. The links will be in the chat. Uh, we appreciate all of our Elevate members. They hugely contribute to our work. Uh, thank you so much for your time and I'm gonna pass it back to Paul. Thank you so much, Magdalena, that's great. Um, so we'll just skip along. And um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Kathleen Morrison Research Impact Award. And I'm a little nervous because I see Kathleen has joined us in the audience as well. So uh, welcome, Kathleen. We're, we're glad that, that you're here today. Um, so CF Canada supported research has really made huge advancements um, over the time the organization has been in, in existence but particularly during the period of time where Kathleen was the CEO. And she was the longest serving CEO of the organization. So from 1981 to 2011. And over that time, the estimated median age of survival for Canadians with cystic fibrosis rose from just over 20 years to nearly 50 years, which is a huge impact. And that was driven by research that Kathleen has championed and has led the organization to support so well. So really we're very proud of Kathleen and that's why her name is on this award because she's had such a huge impact on cystic fibrosis in Canada. And we wanted to offer an award to other researchers where we felt that their work could have a large impact on our community as well. So the Kathleen Morrison Research Impact Award was developed and it's awarded to the proposal through our competition that ranks the highest by our community reviewers. So the community reviewers score all of the proposals and the highest one is the one that they feel would have the strongest impact for our community. I just wanted to also touch upon uh, the Sarah Gordon Sutherland Memorial Fund. I'm not sure if members of the Gordon family were able to join us today, um, but they've really helped us. They've been instrumental in, in allowing us to fund Dr. Bear's research. Um, so the, the Sarah Gordon Sutherland Memorial Fund uh, generously provided a grant for basic research that's going directly to support Dr. Bear's research. And we're very thankful to the Gordon family for making this possible. Um, and, and it's a great way to, to remember Sarah by. So thank you very much for that. So finally, <laughs> almost to the good part, um, it, it gives me great pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Christine Baer, who is the winner of our Kathleen Morrison Research Impact Award. Um, so Christine is um, a researcher at the Hospital for Sick Children. She's been there for a number of years. I won't say how many, Christine. Um, Thank you, Paul. She's, <laughs> she's the co-director of the CF Center at Sick Kids, and she's the leader of the CFIT program. And um, just a, as a point of, um, I don't know, um, acknowledgement. So I was the program director for CFIT, working with Christine in the past before I joined. Uh, CF Canada. So certainly I do have a, a history with Christine. Um, Christine is a senior scientist in the molecular medicine program at SickKids and also she's a professor of physiology at the University of Toronto. And she's very much an expert in how the CFTR protein functions and, and some of her earlier work was instrumental in uh, identifying what the role of the CFTR protein was in the cell, that of a chloride channel. And so as I mentioned, Christine is the winner of the Kathleen Morrison Research Impact Award, and she was also the winner of the CF Canada Senior Scientist Research Award for her uh, excellent research proposal. So we're, we're quite excited uh, to have Christine joining us today. And now I have to do a little bit of a switcheroo to switch from my slides uh, to, to Christine's slides. So uh, Give me one moment here um, and hopefully 
I, oh, I'm on the wrong. There we go. <laughs> um, are you able to see that? Did I do it right? Yes, it looks good. Thanks, Paul. Okay, great. Welcome, Christine, please. Thank you. And thank you for the wonderful introduction. And I have to say uh, how grateful I am to be uh, the winner of the Kathleen Morrison Award. Um, and also that Kathleen is here because as Paul mentioned, um, Kathleen has been a tremendous champion of scientists and uh, people with CF for decades. And I first got to know her when I joined Sick Kids Hospital way back. Um, and it was close to the time when the, the gene discovery was made. And this is an old picture of uh, Lachi, Francis Collins, and uh, Jack Reardon. And Kathleen was, um, was a cheerleader, not only a cheerleader, but she was um, basically driving a lot of momentum towards the acknowledgements of the, the Canadian researchers for this tremendous achievement. So I'm really grateful to be the recipient of this award. And uh, maybe we can have an offline chat afterwards, Kathleen. And I'm also grateful to the community uh, members who voted for my application. So um, I'll be describing it in a little bit of detail now. And so if you've got any questions, I'd be really um, interested to, to discuss them with you. And I'm also very grateful to the Sarah Gordon Family Fund for funding this research. So Paul, would you mind going to the next slide? And uh, this is a slide um, just kind of as, a, as an introduction, which nobody needs um, on this call. It's a, but I, I put it up, it's basically highlighting the fact that uh, CF, cystic fibrosis, is um, a genetic disease that affects multiple organs. So that's what this, this slide is showing you. It's affecting, and we didn't really appreciate this initially, but it's affecting multiple systems obviously the lung, but heart through to the reproductive tract and bones. What I'm going to be talking about today is um, our system called uh, nasal cell avatars, where we hope to model the disease in the lung and also how therapies work for everybody. So I'm gonna be talking about our methods in the lab to study airway cells. Paul, next slide, please. And again, I think many of you have seen this little graphic before, but there are um, many mutations in the CFTR gene, which are associated uh, with disease. And of the thousands that have been identified through genetic sequencing, we now know that there's um, roughly 400 or so where those mutations um, cause a loss of function of CFTR. And that's through uh, the work done at CFTR too. And since there's so many, it's easier to discuss them in terms of different classifications. So normally, if you look on the left-hand side, the CFTR gene makes a protein, which is green, that gets to the surface, which is that black line there. And when it's there and turned on, chloride ion goes through it. And then it's that movement of chloride ion, which is accompanied by sodium salt and water, which keeps the airways nice and moist and a perfect environment to control um, bacterial infections, basically remove pathogens through movement of the mucus through the cilia that are beating on the airways. Now there are different classifications of mutations that lead to loss of that function. And the most common one is called Delta 508 and that's in the class two. This, this time the protein is um, not quite shaped properly because of that deletion. And it's recognized as not being shaped properly and not, does not get to the cell surface. So you've lost that chloride channel function. That's called a class two, it's a classification because we know there's many other mutations which cause a similar problem. And so I'm gonna be getting to that a little bit later. Um, G551D, that's in a class three. This uh, mutation causes the protein to, although it can 
get all the way to the surface. You see, and um, that's uh, the fourth column there. Once it's there, it doesn't work properly. So chloride cannot get through. That's class three. And I'm gonna be touching on that a little bit in the presentation. And I'm also gonna be touching a little bit on um, class one mutations. Um, and the most common one, yeah, one of those is tryptophan 1282X. And it basically leads to a lack of protein production. And this one is gonna require some, um, is a very active area of research for discovery for therapies right now. And I'm gonna to touch on that a little bit later. So Paul, would you want to go to the next slide? So as you know, um, there has been such an enormous um, transformation in terms of the therapies that are available with four medications available to treat um, mutations, primarily Delta 508. Um, on the, on the left-hand side, I have a little schematic about how these are thought to work. So the first one that came out in 2012 was called Kaleidico or Ivacaster. And it's, um, it's shown in the, the middle of the panel. So in this case, it helps the mutant protein to open. That's what Ivacaster does. And um, that's okay for G551D because that mutation can get to the surface and it needs that effect of Ivacaftor to open it. But it's not enough for Delta 508, that misshapen protein. It needs additional compounds called correctors to help it achieve a better shape so that it can get to the cell surface. So Orcambi has one of these so-called corrector compounds called Lumacaftor. It helps a little bit of the misshapen protein to get to the surface. And then with Ivacaftor, it works to move chloride. Simdeco is very similar. And then you know about Tricaftor, which is uh, two of these shape inducing corrector proteins that work very well to allow the protein to get to the surface. And then it's turned on by uh, Ivacaftor. Tricaftor was approved in 2021, June 18th. So it's remarkable. And we're seeing a very positive effect of Trikafta in many people with uh, Delta 508. Next slide, please, Paul. And it's really amazing now to see that for this expensive drug, my understanding is that all Canadian provinces have now agreed to reimburse the costs of Trikafta for those people over six years of age. So that is tremendous achievement, um, reflecting the advocacy by all of the, the patients and, and particularly CF Canada, working with the patients and their parents to bring this to the attention of uh, the regulatory bodies. So it's a huge achievement. The next slide, please, Paul. Um, and of course, we have to keep, um, as scientists, moving the field ahead. So we know that Trikafta has had some incredibly positive effects for um, many people with Delta 508. But in some people, there are side effects. It is expensive. And there are a few people that don't respond very well. So there's always a need for new modulator discoveries for the major mutants. Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, Delta 508 falls into this classification. So it's the most common of the class two, but there are others that do a similar type, have a similar type of issue as Delta 508, that misshapen protein. And uh, we, we know through some of the studies that you've um, funded through CFIT that Trikafta has the potential to work on some of these other mutations. So we're gonna talk about that. And then I'm also going to talk about um, another unmet need, which is novel strategies for those rare mutations where there's a, a protein production problem. Um, and that includes uh, tryptophan 1282X. <clears throat> Paul, could you go to the next slide, please? So Paul mentioned CFIF. So this is the big bio resource uh, called the Program for Individualized Cystic Fibrosis Therapies that was funded by CF Canada 
and Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. And the mandate for CFIT is to help advance precision medicines for CF using patient to drive tissues, and we call them avatars. Next slide, please. So what is CFIT? Uh, Paul, I guess next slide. <laughs> Here we go. So um, as I said, it's a, a bioresource which is created due to the donations by people with CF around Canada. So it's, it's because of um, CF Canada patients that we now have this resource um, which contains nasal cells, those avatars. Um, blood samples are also taken and from the blood samples, there's a complete uh, genome sequencing of that individual that's matched to their clinical data. And then we also, from their blood, generate um, stem cells or, or what we called induced pluripotent stem cells. And I'll tell you the advantage of these stem cells for therapy discovery later on in the, in the presentation. These stem, oh, thank you, Paul. So um, now the bioresource has matched nasal cultures, stem cells, genome, genomic data, clinical data from hundreds of people, 120 Canadians, and we also have 14 international participants. And next slide, please, Paul. And just to make a comment first, this, this is an open resource, a resource that was created by you and um, the experts at um, SickKids and also at University of Toronto to provide tools for therapy discovery and therapy testing, not just by us, but all academic researchers across Canada and internationally. And Paul, as um, manager of the CFIT program, will be able to tell you just how many people have been seeking out these tissues for exactly that reason. We settled on making um, the nasal avatar model because we think that these tissues will give us the most information about that person's response to therapies because the nasal tissue not only reflects the genetic background of each person, not only their CFTR mutation, but also other genes that are in that tissue and how those are, are turned on, but it's also reflective of that, the life of that person, their environment and lifestyle. And it's together that there's an impact on that tissue. And we can grow cells, and this is um, how we grow them in these little cups which basically mimic the nasal epithelium, which is a complex number of different cell tissue, cell types that mimics in very large part, the airways. So it's as close as we can get um, to get um, a sample of your, your airways, these nasal avatar models. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, and then this process, this took a lot of iteration so that we did it uh, properly. And, and basically, because we wanna be able to make comparisons amongst uh, tens, twenties people, we wanna make sure that everything is done identically in a very standardized way. So the cells are only obtained by one person. Of these 121 Canadians, Julie Abolio, um, who is working with Felix Ratchin, brushes nasal epithelial cells. And the cultures are generated in a very standardized way by um, people in Theo Morris's lab, a scientist at SickKids, Hong, Torini, and Asomia. And they're grown in a very standardized way. And they make, I'm showing you here, a picture of what we see on a confocal microscope of those tissues. The colors are conferred um, artificially, just so you can see what it looks like, but the blue are the nuclei of the nasal cells. CFTR is indicated as a little patch here in green, and the cilia 
those structures that beat bacteria out of the airways is decorated in red. So this is what we're obtaining through these nasal culture avatars. Next slide, please, Paul. So how can these avatars help? Well, it is our hypothesis that if a drug responds in someone's avatar, it may forecast how they're gonna respond on the drug if they take it in terms of changes in their lung function. And if the drug responses in the avatar forecast that individual's clinical responses, in the future, they'll have the potential to guide decisions regarding access to drugs and prescriptions. And the, the pictures that I show at the bottom is one example of, of what we do. So someone um, in this case with Delta 508 or G551D, their nose is brushed, cultures are made, and they're treated with uh, these drugs. In this case, I've got Orcambi or Kaleidico. And then we measure what happens to that channel activity. It's channels are electrical in nature. So we can use currents to measure whether CFTR is turned on or not. And that's what I'm showing you here. So we can see with this response that this individual did respond. This is just a, a cartoon to show the, the thought process. And then we see if the response in the dish also corresponds to a response in terms of lung function. And in this case, this uh, individual is undergoing um, forced expiratory uh, volume measurement. So again, if we can see something in the avatars that forecasts how they respond um, in terms of changes in lung function on that same drug, we have the potential to use these then to guide future decisions. And I'm gonna get back to this point a few times. Um, then in the next slide, Paul, we asked if there is a correlation between what happens on the dish. So that's everything along this uh, x-axis, the flat line, and what happens in uh, lung measurements. So that's along the, the, the y-axis. So these lung measurements, function measurements were done um, in the Felix Rachin laboratory. And the function in the dish was conducted by uh, the Tanya Gonska laboratory. And without looking at the numbers, you can see that there's a lot of scatter, but it can basically be fit by a line. You can put a line through these data and that's telling you that there is a correlation, that there is a correlation between what happens in the lab and what happens in real life for these drugs on these people's nasal epithelia. So each one of these dots is a different person's nasal avatar and their resulting lung function. Next slide, please. So the new grant that was funded um, and supported by the Sarah Gordon uh, Family Fund and for which we won the Kathleen Morrison Award is to do this same type of matching study, this correlation study for people who are just starting on Trikafta. So we take nasal cultures from people before they go on to Trikafta. So these are the avatars before they go on Trikafta. They're treated to see if they respond to Trikafta. And then without knowing, we save those numbers and we look to see how that person does over time on Trikafta. So we're trying to build the argument that these avatars really have a use in predicting clinical outcome, because then we can use that later on as I'll, I'll discuss. So, so far, nasal avatars from 15 people starting Trikafta at Sick Kids Hospital and St. Paul's Hospital have been made and they're being studied and recruitment is continuing. And now we're tracking those same people to see what happens to their lung function over time on Trikafta. And if there is a positive correlation, we're going to help advocate for the use of avatars to inform drug access at a later, in later situations. Next slide, please, Paul. 
these are the people who are on this team. So it's a multi-center team. Bradley Kwan, you heard from him recently from St. Paul's Hospital. Um, uh, Stan, uh, Sanya Stan, Stanjevic, I'm sorry, Sanya. <laughs> I'm sorry I didn't do that to your name. She's from uh, Dalhousie and she is our um, statistician for this work. And then at Sick Kids, Tanya Gonska, myself, Theo Mores, and Felix Ratchin. So we're all involved in this project. Next slide, please, Paul. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is that what, what about those people with rare mutations that are similar to uh, Delta 508, you know, that fit into that class two category? Can we use their nasal epithelial cells to predict whether they're going to show a positive response to Trikafta? Next slide, please. So I just wanted to take you into the weeds here. And, and this is inside baseball. Basically, this is what we, we measure in these nasal avatars. And I know Lapchi Choi would call these wiggly lines, and it was always very insulting when he did, but this is what, this is what we look at. So if you don't have CF, this is what the profile of your channel activity looks like when you turn it on and turn it off. So you see that there's um, a change. It's not a flat line. And as there's um, a change in the profile, that's the movement of chloride ion. Now in this individual that has Delta 508, um, there's a flat line here. So if you look at the middle one, Paul, there it's completely flat. Now, the nasal avatars from that same person were treated with the combination of molecules in Trikafta. You can see that it's no longer flat. There's chloride channel activity, chloride is moving. And then when we summarize all of this and each of these points is a different person, you can see that there's a, a big change in chloride channel function in these avatars. Next slide, so that's Delta 508. Now we're looking at avatars from people with rare M1101K, G85E, N1303K. So the first thing you notice is that the profiles are not the same. The mutations are causing slightly different effects and they respond slightly differently to Trikafta. But in contrast to the flat lines up above, you can start to see that chloride ion is moving in these in these different rare mutations. And they're different. So if you have M1101K, there's a bigger response than if you have G85E or N1303K. Next slide, please, Paul. So I'm just showing you this scattergram here. It's kind of um, mind numbing, but these are uh, many of the people that we've studied nasal avatars for, um, not everybody because we still have more numbers, but I want to give you a sense of what we're looking at. So if we look at this chart, um, on the y-axis, this is how much chloride channel function you have. And I'll, oops, and then along the x-axis, um, these are all the different people before and after Trikafta. So these are all people with Delta 508, the brown, before is open circle, after Trikafta. Something, yeah. So you can see that a lot of them, they're starting to move in terms of their chloride channel function. And the, but there's a big variation. So some are not going up as high as others. But that kind of variation is also found in people without CF, so those are the the green squares. So there's a big range in function. And that is because, as I said before, these avatars are reflecting individuals, their genetic background and their environmental exposures. So I think that's why you're seeing this variation. Now, in the context of this variation and the response to Trikafta with Delta 508, let's look at these rares. So G85, the purple, before and after, open circle to triangle, it's budging. So we've looked at three people. We've looked at at least three people with M1101K, big change. 
we've looked at here, we, we have more than two, um, but there's two here, N1303K, it's a change. There's nothing going on with uh, tryptophan 1282X, which is not surprising because it doesn't fall into this class. It's one of those mutations which doesn't prevent, that prevents the protein from being made. So there's really not much going on there. And the same for this one, 569D. So we can see that um, there's some of these rare mutations which are really showing quite a, a decent response in the dish to Trikafta. Next slide, please, Paul. So before we can use these data and go to Health Canada and say, well, listen, these M1101K individuals are responding very well. They should be on Trikafta. We need to prove that we do have a predictive model, which is why we are doing this um, project, the Trikafta project that I described. We need to show that in Delta 508 patients, before they start Trikafta, their avatar function looks decent, and then that also translates to a good improvement in lung function. So we're starting to do that, as I mentioned. And here's one example. This individual, a nice avatar response, and also a nice change in FEV1. I think it was after one year on drug. So we're, we're making these connections. Next slide, please, Paul. So that is the purpose of the, the, the grant that uh, was funded is to try and look for those, those connections so we can build a case for the use of these predictive models. Now, how else can we use CFET? I think we can use CFET um, to study new innovative strategies for the repair of rare mutations. Paul, the next slide, please. So this is where the stem cells come in. The nasal cells, you can grow quite a few nasal cells in different avatar cultures, but not that many. Um, there's a limitation. You can maybe get perhaps 10 to 20 avatars, but that's it. And if you're doing drug discovery work, you need to fill plates and plates with cells. And that's what I'm showing on the right-hand side to test various different strategies, combinations of strategies. And the only way you're gonna be able to fill a plate with somebody's personalized um, tissue is using stem cells. So the CFIT has made iPSC cultures from all of the individuals who've been recruited, including those with tryptophan 1282X. We're growing them to early lung cultures that can then fill these plates and we're testing different therapeutic strategies. Next slide, please, Paul. And this is work that we're doing together with Amy Wong. Um, and she had her seminal nature biotechnology paper in 2012. And we learned, and she learned a way to turn an iPSC cell into early lung, which was also called stage three. And then, um, a more mature form of that lung cell if it's put onto a filter and exposed to air. Now, these cultures are not readily, cannot be readily studied in that system here. You know, that, the grid that I'm showing at the bottom, we can't fill all the wells with this type of material, but we can with the early stage lung. We can fill each of these wells with early stage lung from an individual's iPSCs, and we can study responses to different interventions. Next slide, Paul. And this is what we did. So we color-coded responses here, and um, this is a proof of concept study. We were testing laboratory compounds that are not drugs yet um, on tryptophan 1282X, and this is a combination of five different molecules finally, that showed a response. So what do I mean by a response? In non-CF early lung cells, if we treat them with something that turns on CFTR, they all respond and we color-coded that as red. But 
in wells that are coated with early lung cells from someone with tryptophan 12 at E2X, they stay dark even after you turn on CFTR, unless you've got this combination of five different compounds and it starts to, to respond. We looked at three different individuals. That's what these different bars look like. And if you look at the bottom, so bar G, that's one of our best uh, combinations. But for with this individual, it doesn't move very much. This individual, there's a big response. So I think what we're seeing in these early lung cultures is also patient to patient variability, which ref is the ref property of these avatars. Next slide, please, Paul. So we've been working with Zenia Ivakan at SickKids Hospital to test different um, CRISPR editing techniques to remove that mutation, which we think is going to be necessary to completely um, restore function to these, these avatars. So um, CRISPR-based technology, I'm sure you've heard a lot about that, and is an active area of research for precisely these types of mutations. And we can study them in this grid-like pattern of early lung cells from people who have donated their stem cells who have tryptophan 12 at E2X. We want to confirm that those hits where we saw the red actually do work on that person's same nasal cells using the nasal avatars. And then if they do, have a discussion about these results with um, drug development and therapy development companies. Next slide, please, Paul. So CFIT is, even though um, the, the official fundraising for CF is finished, we are still here and we're still serving the community, not only by the work that we're doing at SickKids, but because this is an open resource, which is serving academics and um, pharmaceutical partners around uh, the world to provide evidence for improved access for therapies and to discover novel strategies, particularly for these rare mutations like tryptophan 12 at E2X. Next slide, please, Paul. So this is a CFIT team. Not everybody is here, but you recognize uh, Paul. He was, he was the, the manager of this program and he kept the, the wheels turning for five years, even more than five years. And Felix Ratchen is uh, the clinical co-lead of CFIT. Julie is the one who brushed people's noses for the nasal avatars. Theo Mores is a person who is the director of the nasal avatar generation lab. And these are our stem cell biologists who are working on stem cell models, Amy Wong and Mina Agawa. And Tarini is, uh, and Tarini and Hong are making the nasal avatars. And uh, sorry, and Anofrio uh, Osalva, who is a postdoc in our lab, he was the one who helped to generate many of the rare mutation data slides that I showed you. So thank you again for um, giving me the, the prestigious Kathleen Morrison Award. And I'm very, very grateful for your support. And I look forward to hearing any questions that you might have. Got to find my mute button. Sorry, I jumped ahead on a couple of slides there. I don't know what happened, um, but thank you very much. That was that was terrific, Christine. So, um, oh, there was the. the oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, just quickly. Um, if you build it, they will come. Basically, that philosophy holds true for CFED. We built it, and then all of these other partners wanted in. So we have all the sick kids researchers, McGill researchers who are involved in um, thinking about ethical questions that are related to the use of stem cells, not necessarily in CFIT, but in future applications. Um, UHN, Gordon Keller, uh, Shinagawa, 
are involved in stem cell generation of bile ducts. So I didn't mention it, but we're looking at other tissues too. Marie Cron is an economist who is looking at economic models of uh, therapy development. And as I said, this is uh, the gem. This is the root of the whole fantastic tree. And these are the branches. Other people came to support it, including uh, CF Foundation in the US, Genome Canada, Ontario Genomics, and Genome Quebec. Thanks, Paul. Great. Thank you, Christine. So um, I'm just going to try and switch back to my slides. Um, and, and we've already got a couple of questions starting to come in. You can, you can put your questions in here and they'll show up on the screen or you can put them in the Zoom chat, whichever you prefer. So um, maybe we could start with, with the one here at the top from Nancy. Okay. Are you still looking for rare yes. mutations? Yes, so uh, we are. We do need to find um, some way of, um, of helping continue the recruitment because we are extremely interested in continuing to look for rare um, homozygous mutations. And Paul, did you have a comment that you wanted to make regarding the, the continued recruitment? Well, yeah, so it's, it's important that we continue to develop the resource and include uh, more mutations if we can. So um, we've, we've certainly got to look for other ways to fund this because it's very expensive to, to bring people into Toronto if, if we're doing the collection here with Julie. Julie um, is, is located at SickKids and to develop all of these resources that, that are involved. Uh, one thing that's happening is Christine mentioned um, she's working with Brad Kwan at St. Paul's Hospital in BC. And so they're training people there to do what Julie does and do what Theo Morez's group does so that they'll be able to collect nasal cells there at least so people don't have to come all the way to Toronto. Um, but really what you can do if if you have a rare mutation that you think should be part of this resource is you can reach out to me and we'll keep track of your contact information. And as we have money that allows us to continue at least in a small way, then we could potentially reach out to you. So uh, the you. second question, thanks Paul. Uh, the second question in the graph, you showed chloride movement in three rare mutations. So how much is enough to make mm -hmm. a meaningful difference in a person's life? Well, that's a million dollar question. And I don't think we're there yet. Um, but what we can say is that there's, there's a difference, right? There's a difference in how, how much improvement you can see depending on the, on the mutation. And with that knowledge, um, we, we can say that there's a need perhaps for additional um, therapy discovery work for those who are, are not moving that much. Um, but I think it, we are working with epidemiologists to answer that question. Um, what is a threshold for a good response in the dish? And what is the threshold for a good response um, clinically. And with this funded project, um, we'll be able to get a better answer for that question uh, because we will be able to make direct links between the, the culture assay and health. But we can't answer that yet. It's a great question. Oh, lights are going off in my building. <laughs> <laughs> Time to go. So could the results of this study open up new avenues of research? And exactly. So um, I think I, I tried to give an example of how we can use the stem cells for testing new strategies to target the nonsense mutations. And then also for those um, class two mutations that are budging, but not a lot, I think we can also work on a new new small molecules to boost that response. Um, Nancy, how does CFIT differ from the, ther 
How does CFIT differ from the therotyping that they do in other countries, such as US, Italy, et cetera? And do they have similar biobanks or is CFIT unique? So that's a great question. Um, there's, there are different approaches that you see um, across different jurisdictions. In Europe, there are um, many institutions that are collecting uh, rectal organoids and looking at responses in rectal tissue as potentially predictive of outcomes uh, for health after taking a particular inter um, intervention. In the US, um, there's also a combination of both nasal culture banks and rectal organoid banks in Italy as well and in France. I think, and in Australia. So this is a very burning question for a lot of jurisdictions. How can you come up with a predictive tool? What I think CFIT has, which other, other jurisdictions don't have, is that we have really made a conscious effort to get homozygous individuals. And the advantage to that is that you know exactly um, what mutation is responding to a particular um, intervention. If you have two different mutations, it makes it a bit difficult to be completely um, certain about that. So we have what is considered one of the largest biobanks of homozygotes. And that's in fact, we're being approached just because of that. And also we have linked data. We've got links, not only between the biological material, the stem cells, and the nasal cultures. The stem cells can look at hundreds of different conditions, hundreds and thousands of conditions. And we can look to see if that matches with uh, nasal avatars, but it's also matched with patient-specific genomic data and clinical data. As I said, we chose the avatars because they, they mimic, they, they report both your genetic background and your environment in CFIT we know exactly what that whole genetic background is. And that I have not seen in any of these other jurisdictions. So it's a very rich resource because of that. So Christine, um, I think I'll pass it over to Catherine. She said there are a few questions in the Zoom chat as well. So maybe Catherine, if you wanted to read those out. Yeah, okay. And the first one is from Leanne. She says, thank you for your research and dedication. She says, my son okay. has CFSPID with DF508 from my husband and M9523 and M1191 from myself. Just curious if those mutations might be of interest for the study. So thank you very much. Everything is of interest. And what we can do is you send me um, a note or, or Paul. I haven't written down those mutations. We'll check to see if we have these in uh, the biobank. But basically, I think I'm going to put Paul on the hook here for these types of questions, just to make sure that um, we get we, we capture everything that we can from the community. I put my email address okay. into the chat there in, in the Zoom chat. So feel free to reach out to me okay. by my email address. So uh, Anonymous has got uh, another question. So do you see a difference in avatars from heterozygotes versus homozygotes for a Delta 508? So that's a great question. And we can't really answer that precisely for the reason that I mentioned at the beginning that we've really been focusing on um, studying homozygotes so that we, we know what mutations are responding to the interventions. But if you remember, there was still a big spread, right? So even, even with identical mutations on both alleles, you can see quite a spread in the response, which I think reflects other factors in the genetic background, possibly environmental factors. Great. And then Catherine, I think there was another comment in the in the chat. Yes, it's from Jillian. 
She says, I just wanted to thank Dr. Bear and the entire research team. My son was part of this program back in 2012 by providing skin cells. And I'm so excited oh, wow. to see how far it's come. My son got to see the lab as well when he was a little older. Love seeing all of this. Thank you for all your commitment. Oh, that's wonderful. I think I remember meeting you too. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. So you and basically just, started the ball rolling. Yeah. In terms of the stem cell work. <laughs> yeah. So we don't we don't collect skin cells anymore. We take the the cells from the blood, and now they can they can make the the stem cells um, from blood cells rather than skin, which is a lot easier and and less complicated to to collect. But. So. Um, that sample started everything. He, she says he was five months old. At oh, time. my goodness. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> There's a note here from Kathleen Morrison as well. She says it's wonderful to see this overview. Thank you, Dr. Bear and Paul and Cystic Kyprosis Canada. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, Kathleen. <laughs> we'll have to touch base. And, and we've got an, another comment up here on the screen. What else can potentially be learned from a person's nasal cells? Well, there are so many questions. Um, the nasal cells, it's not just one type of cell. Um, there's many different types of cells and some play a particularly important role in terms of immune responses. So, Back, you probably remember back in the early days of COVID, people were doing a lot of studies on nasal cells. And we learned a lot about what um, in a person's nasal cell is, is, is really functioning in the immune response. So there's a lot that we can learn in terms of um, immune responses, um, people with CF and non-CF from uh, looking at nasal cultures. And so that's being done. Um, and it's so we, we should apply that. People are doing that. People are using CFIT cultures to study immune responses now. Yeah. And another thing, if, if I might add, um, Christine's lab has very cool um, bead tracking assays that you could do on nasal cells as well. So if you wanted to mention that, Christine, I think that's a great application. Yeah, so as you know, one of the major features of airway disease is um, the thick sticky mucus that obstructs uh, the airways. And the nasal epithelium, they have the same types of cells as, uh, as the airways that make mucus. And you can see on the top of um, a nasal avatar that uh, someone who's got CF, there's a, it's a thicker, stickier mucus than uh, the mucus on someone's nasal avatar that doesn't have CF. So if you really think the most important thing is not just the movement of chloride, but how that moves um, mucus and makes it more fluid, we can study that um, using these avatars and we do. Um, it's, it's a pretty cool assay as Paul mentioned, it's a live cell assay where you can see the ciliated cells move um, these fluorescent beads around in a circle. So in your lung, they would move um, the beat, the, the cilia would beat and move mucus from, um, move it upwards and, and out of your, your airways. But the avatars, they're a little bit confused. <laughs> they don't know where to move. So the cilia are kind of beating in a circle, but we use that to our advantage and we can watch these waves of, um, of uh, beads moving. And in CF, they don't, they're stuck. But if you add trichafta or other, or other agents, which help chloride to move, fluid to move, and the mucus become more fluid, then these beads start to, to bead in a circle again. So that's another way that uh, we can study these avatars. I wanted to ask a question if I can, Christine, and that's about the next generations of CF modulators, either from Vertex or from some other companies. How do you think the work that you're doing now and the existence of the CFIT resource and what we're learning from that, how do you, how do you think that that's going to impact future CF modulators? 
Well, I think the future modulators, um, the business plan for those would have to be that they would work better than Trikafta. And if they don't work better on everybody, they will work better on those people that are not doing very well on Trikafta. So in CFET, we've got a record of how those avatars from different individuals work. And you could see that some of them did not move that much chloride and other ones did. So those ones where you didn't see a good chloride response, if this next gen um, combination comes along, you would want, I would think, to see if it worked better on those that are, are not responsive. And that would distinguish your modulator from what's out there. So um, we, we spent a lot of time setting up the system so that we would have enough nasal cells that we could keep going back to the freezer and get some from the same person to retest with a new intervention. So we're in a position where we can do that. And there's another question here. How long will it take to know whether Trikafta will work on different mutations? Well, you see, that is, this is why we're kind of building this argument. With the grant that we got, if we can show there's a connection between what happens in the dish and what happens in real life for Trikafta on Delta 508, then um, we would like to speak with you and other advocates to approach um, the regulatory bodies to consider this evidence. Because if that's the case, you can see that connection, then we should be able to apply that to the, the rare mutations and say, well, we saw this mutation responded very well. So this is a good, this is a good reason to try, try it on that individual because we built the evidence on the Delta 508 studies already. So I don't know how long it's gonna take. It always takes too long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, I have uh, another question in the yeah. chat. Uh, this is from Nancy Turner. Uh, the question is, do different mutations cause the fluorescent beads to move differently, or is it more a matter of them moving with more intensity? Well, that's a great question. I don't think I can give you a good answer because we haven't done this bead assay on that many mutations, but I... But I think it's gonna be um, interesting because some mutations, um, they affect the way that the CFTR channel moves by carbonate. So I didn't mention that at the beginning, but some, so CFTR not only moves chloride, but it also moves by carbonate, which basically makes the fluid um, more, alkaline, and that helps the mucus to uh, become more fluid as well. So you might expect, um, depending on the type of mutation, there is going to be differences in the, the speed at which those move. Um, so maybe not so much the intensity, but the speed at which those move. I think that is going to be the, the, the factor, because that's what we see change when we add trikafta to the Delta 508 mutations, we see the speed of, of the beads move. And so if you've got a mutation with a little bit of residual function, you'll see a slow moving beads that will speed up more on the, on the intervention. Well, that's great. That, th those have been some really excellent questions. Um, oh, yes. Thank you everybody for your participation. That's wonderful. Um, if I can indulge, oh, indulge no. <laughs> everybody, D don't worry, the results are not going to show on the screen this time, but if you could just let us know what you thought about Dr. Bear's presentation, and then I have just a couple of more uh, questions for you before we close off uh, for the evening. I'll just give it a, a minute or so for, for people to respond here. We can see the numbers of people responding here, but not, not what you're saying. <laughs> but judging based on the response of the questions, I think people enjoyed the talk. So that, that was great. Okay, and then if I can um, switch to the, the next question here. Do you think this information session was informative and useful? 
just more generally. And if you'd like to see more um, sessions like this in the future, um, let us know by a, a higher rating. Great, thank you. Thanks for, for the responses. And um, would you like us to host more of these events? Similar question. That's a pretty, pretty straightforward one. And then I think there might be just one, one or two more questions after this. Oh, what, yeah, right. What other topics would you like to see maybe in future sessions? Would you, would you like to hear about something in, in particular? If you can think of something, let us know. If you think of something later, um, feel free to, to email me as well. Um, great, more research mutations, great. And we can certainly, I'll, I'll let people just finish typing here. Um, but certainly feel free to reach out to me later as well if something pops into your head that, that didn't pop in before. Um, for example, do you wanna hear about phage therapy and things like that or new antibiotics? Great, somebody mentioned Dr. Waters. Um, great, nonsense mutations are definitely um, do people have interest in, in learning more about CF as we age or um, CF related diabetes or CF liver disease? Any, any of these topics, if, if enough people are interested in them, I'm sure we can, we can look into having an expert come and, and give some talks about them. Um, so feel free also, like I said, to reach out to me later. And... Final thoughts, if anybody has any final thoughts for the day, this is the last question and um, feel free to, to let us know. But uh, while you're typing, I just wanted to thank Dr. Bear again for um, a really fascinating talk. And thank you all for not only attending, but also participating. So I think the, the questions in my mind were what well, that was the best part um, of the evening, hearing, hearing your thoughts and, and Dr. Bear's responses to, to, to your questions, I think was uh, really great. I also had a great time and I, I, I typed out my, my email because if you have any other questions, I'd love to hear them. Absolutely. And so that's in the Zoom chat there. Yeah. Um, and, oh, Catherine made a nice um, a comment as well uh, to everybody. So um, thank you very much. Yes, thank you uh, for supporting research as well, because certainly we couldn't, we couldn't fund impactful research like Dr. Bear's research if we didn't have individuals, you know, participating in the walk and collecting um, donations there and um, participating in all the different ways you do and also participating in the research. So providing your nasal cells and your blood cells um, to, to do the research without all of those people that over 120 Canadians who stepped up and subjected themselves to a nasal brush, which is not, it's not the, the greatest thing. It's, it's not awful, but it's not, not my most favorite thing. And I've I've been a healthy control before, so I know I know what it's like and I know what we ask the patients to do. And certainly Christine has been a healthy control probably more than anybody. <laughs> so, um, but we really, we really appreciate it. We really, we really appreciate your participation um, today as well. So thank you everybody. Any other thoughts, anybody before we, we close off for tonight? Well, thanks again, Christine, and thanks again, everybody. Um, and glad that, that everybody enjoyed it. And we'll look forward to doing something like this again in the future. Thank you. I had a great thanks time everyone. and have a good evening, everyone. Okay, bye-bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. See you, Paul. Thanks, Christine. Bye-bye. Bye, Catherine. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.